thank all of you for coming. It's an interesting idea to talk about to sanctify the arts. We six speakers were invited, and none of us have any idea what the other people are talking about. <laughs> and so, we'll hopefully we'll raise questions. Hopefully, it will be an interesting discussion. My part in this is as a practitioner because I have been doing some commissions all along and by showing and going through some of those commissions I hope it could raise questions or be of some interest. And so like any good Lutheran presentation, we start off with a quote by Martin Luther. <laughs> and if you, if you, as you look at it, it says, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. Now, did Luther really say it? <laughs> He's attributed to it. But it, what it says is really important to us, especially to me as an artist, because not all of the work I do has little crosses on it. Not all, I, I think an artist can do, can, a Christian artist can do work that isn't necessarily Christian imagery. As long as it expresses a Christian worldview, as long as it is working with the artist's talents to project that Christian worldview. And so I like that. Um, I also thought someone's going to want to identify sanctify. So to make holy, to set apart for sacred or religious purposes, or to give moral or social sanction to your dictionary definition. Then I'm going to continue with um, some con contradictory Luther quotes. One is towards a visual art, and he wasn't actually talking about painting, but just how a pastor might operate. One has to instruct ordinary people simply and childishly as much as one can. Otherwise, one of the two things happen. They will neither learn nor understand, or else they will want to be clever and use their reason to enter into high thoughts, so they move away from belief. And then the other quote is, concerning images, it is also true that they are unnecessary, and we are free to have them or not, although it would be much better if we did not have them at all. I am not partial to them. Now, all, any of you that study Luther know that he says something and then he says something else later, or as they collect his thoughts. But, and I found one more that I think is very pertinent, and this is, whoever is inclined to put pictures on the altar ought to have the Lord's Supper of Christ painted with these two verses written around in golden letters. The gracious and merciful Lord has instituted a remembrance of his wonderful works. Then they would stand before our eyes for our heart to contemplate them, and even our eyes in reading would have to thank and praise God. Since the altar is designated for the administration of the sacrament, one could not find a better painting for it. Other pictures of God or Christ can be painted somewhere else. There isn't that much said with Luther on art, and I just thought, well, let's just start with that, and you can think about it as we go forward. Uh, see, these are some other questions I think the general public always has to deal with. Why do we create art, in this case liturgical art? And what is its purpose? Who needs it? And what about the responsibility? What responsibility does art have if it is sanctified over secular? So those are just things for you to think about as I roll through the, some pictures. Also, how do we pay for liturgical or sanctified art? Shouldn't everything be free that we do for the church? <laughs> and then I'm going to roll through some slides, and there's a little commentary. But this was the first altarpiece that I had the opportunity to, to do, and it was in 1986. And Pastor Warren Granke was the instigator of it. And you might say, well, how does a... a painting come about even, usually they find a patron. You find the money first. You set a budget. You find a patron, you find the money, and then you find an artist, and you talk about the theme. What theme? Then you, the artist would supply you with sketches. Now, Warren Granke um, teamed up with another pastor named Gary Flighty, which I know at least one of you in, in the room knows, or two. But they wanted something modern. I was um, at Bethany at the time, and so they would come to Bethany and talk to me, and, and I did some drawings, and they decided the means of grace could be expressed by baptism, the Word, and the Lord's Supper, and this is the way they actually wanted it. I was like, well, can't we do just, in a, just a crucifixion scene? But no, they, this is what they wanted. So 
at the time, I found a, a former student to pose, I, maintenance built across, and um, I put together the painting. And it's in Madison still. Um, when the other opportunity came with uh, the Trinity Chapel, uh, that was a process that probably took two years where I had built the stretchers, I found the models, it was a laborious, the president would come in and check on it, uh, Marvin Meyer. Uh, people weren't that happy with it at first. It seemed, well, at least there were some complaints. It was too Catholic. Why are we showing art in the front of the church? Now, it wasn't from Bethany, but it was from people associated with Bethany. They weren't used to it. The idea that we have a large painting in the front of the church seemed foreign and Catholic. And when I painted it, I really thought, wow, this will be, I'll be set for life. I'll be doing so many religious paintings, I won't be able to even think straight. And it didn't happen that way. The painting went up and years passed. I still, one of my favorite events with this painting is coming up, Christmas at Bethany, when the choir is all in front and they're all singing and then they open it slowly. I mean, I, to me, I still get chills. It's still one of my favorite. And you can get used to it. We've been looking at it now since 1996 every day. And so sometimes it becomes invisible. And so um, when it's open like that, functioning like it would have in the late Gothic period or Renaissance, that's exciting to me. It's held up pretty well too, considering it's old now. The, um, the one thing needful was also challenging and interesting to paint. Um, I did always, one of the things to remember about, about doing a painting like this is, it's not a singular act. When I was given the commission, I'm talking to the carpenter to help me with the stretchers. I'm talking to the theologians to help me with resources. Both A.D. Harstead and Mark Harstead had been to the Holy Land and I had not. So they had, a, they had books and ideas and, and showed me pictures from their travels that helped inform the painting. Also, the, the chapel committee comes up and they set a budget and we talk to the Board of Regents and it's not just one person deciding, oh, I think I'll do a painting now. The creation fresco is the same way. I went to Italy for a month to learn that I couldn't possibly do this. It was too hard, physically too hard. I mean, I, I feel like I'm sort of strong physically, but I'm not that strong. And so when I, I don't want to say duped or tricked, but when I talked to the, the fresco wall teacher to come to Bethany, that was significant for this to exist. Because he talked to the engineers, he talked to the architects, it was all designed by his specifications. He came and lived in Tigan Hall and we worked on it. But it, it took, from the time I took the class until the time it went up, um, four years had passed. It was in four years of preparation for this. Here are just some of the work pictures that kind of, um, sometimes we, we're, we lose the process because you look at a product and say, yeah, well, that looks okay. Looks like it was done in temper paint. But it was actually um, painstaking and, and difficult. A couple of other occasions, um, I've been, you know, something like this. Karis Carmichael, one of our former students, invited some of us to, show, to do a show where you use like an expired subway card that you swipe to do a painting of a thousand subway cards. And so I decided, well, why not do a picture of Christ with gold leaf? You know, that seems appropriate. So it, it was in some show wherever she was. Um, sometimes you get approached, this case, this was a class from Gustavus where the instructor said, we have this amount of a budget, would you be willing to explore some ideas with us for liturgical work? So I was working with a class at Gustavus and a budget and I had just come back from Istanbul where I was seeing all this gold leaf. I said, I want to do it on wood with gold leaf. And, and I'm going to change the scale of people just to suggest the power of their beliefs or the strength of their belief. So some people are small because they're not there. But these were all actual people from Gustavus that posed. We went into Christ Chapel and I had them all set up and then I, I, I changed some things. It's in the entryway at Christ Chapel. Um, sometimes these things hit 
like when it rains it pours and you get two or three at the same time and you hate to say no. But this one was from a Reformation Lutheran church. I know, I've been told by uh, some that it's really not in Portland, it's in a suburb. But it's, uh, it was an ELS church, then it wasn't an ELS church, and now it is an ELS church again. And they're talking to me now about maybe some seraphim. But they wanted Luther on one side, they wanted Moses on the other, and they wanted Sermon on the Mount. Like, that's not challenging. <laughs> and so I had to do it here at Bethany and ship it, and then I went out for the dedication and make sure it was all, all hung right. But I, it, was, it was really a challenge to try to come up with, with that. Uh, a family approached me. They had lost a, a stillborn, wanted a picture of the, the stillborn baby with the family, with some cousins. And so it's a fairly big painting. It was for a while. It was in St. Mark's in Eau Claire, but the family moved and they took it with them and they keep it in their house. So it's, it's a big, big painting. Um, this was out of the, totally out of the blue, but it's a Wells Church in Sacramento. Jonathan Locher wanted the prodigal son. I sent sketches. They, they approved it step by step. Um, and then one of my students at Bethany, they, they were looking at remodeling a wall and they said, oh, I know someone that can do this. So they, um, Preuss, the trustee, um, uh, Russ Graybaugh was the pastor, but Randy Preuss came, he contacted me to go to this church, and this was a 1939 uh, decorative scheme. I had no idea what I should do, but I made some calls and looked into it, and they wanted to recreate... It, they turned it into this, where they, they blanked the whole wall with sheetrock and said, turn it back into the 1939 decorative scheme at um, St. Peter Bell Church. So I said, okay, but you have to get a lift because I'm not going on scaffolding. As romantic as those things sound, oh, I'm on scaffolding. I'm like Michelangelo. No, I don't want to fall off and die. Uh, but it, 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 this, it was successful. I had to do some rag painting and some stencil, stenciling and some clouds and some symbolic painting. And um, their sister congregation said, hey, you had an artist do work for you. We wanted an artist to do work for us, too. And um, it was David Mummy at Trinity Lutheran in Waterville. And he said, well, you know, I actually contacted one of your former students, and he said he couldn't do it. So I guess we'll try you then. He had asked Jonathan Mayer, and Mayer said, oh, I'm way too busy or whatever. And I said, oh, you, okay. <clears throat> anyway, they wanted the, the Last Supper, the Luther's prize painting for a church. And, um, you know, you might recognize a few of the models are even here today. But I did this Last Supper, and it was uh, seven by nine feet. And uh, they didn't want it for the altarpiece. They wanted it for the side. But in, it's in Waterville, and... Um, I urged some of my models to go see it, but they never have, so that's the kind of appreciation. But what was really interesting about this now is this little congregation kind of got behind it. They loved the painting, and they said, we want more. We want more, more, more. And I think that's one of the lessons of it all is a family bequest came in. How can we celebrate this family's legacy? We're going to do a painting of the Last Supper. The rest of the congregation was so excited that they committed to do, well, I, I, I did three more, and I'm, and I'm late on the fourth one. And so pretty soon this nave will be decorated with my paintings. And I look at it not as one painting now, but as a cycle of paintings or as a, a body of work specific to this church. So the next one they wanted was the resurrection. And, and so I, I did that, and I... It was different from the resurrection I did at Bethany. I, want, I got a chance to try it, but I, the format was set for me. It has to be, you know, this many inches by that many inches, and we're going to put it in between the windows. And I wanted, to, I wanted these soldiers to fade back into the background. I wanted Christ as a halo that really does glow. I wanted to include um, the lilies just because they're associated with the resurrection. I wanted to try to capture kind of this supernatural spiritual event as well as I could um, 
and then they wanted the nativity. And so, wow, some of my relatives look so much like Mary and Joseph. <laughs> But I was in Venice, and I had seen a Tintoretto version with all these wood slats, and I thought, I like that, because it adds a spatial part to it. You can see through the slats. It would have been cold. Um, then I used symbolic elements like the donkey and the ox to reference the prophecy of Christ and the Lamb of God. And so I'm using things that the Good Shepherd, the Lamb, and the prophecy, as well as baby Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Then they wanted the crucifixion, and they didn't really restrict me on this. And I was thinking, I was trying to do um, the moment of Christ's death, which is dramatic, and the sky is going to turn dark. So he's not quite dead, but he's almost there, and his body is bloodied up, and his feet are really raw. Um, and there's a few characters that you might recognize. You know, you have limited models. You have limited budget for models, so you take what you can get. But uh, sometimes it works out, you know, and sometimes you might say, wait a minute, I saw this figure and I saw this figure at Bethany in the chapel and I saw this guy too, he was Joseph. But I, I do keep a, bit, a vast picture file when I need a face, I might go through that. But I was trying to create the sky going dark at the moment of death with kind of light coming from everywhere and a kind of a bit of chaos. And it is pretty raw painted. And I was really happy with it, but, uh, and I even brought Sherry back from some, a photo shoot that I had done in 95. Um, and so this is how these paintings are now at Trinity, Trinity Lutheran in Waterville, you, um, in between the aisles and then the Last Supper. And I'm working on one now of Christ in the temple as a young man, not driving out the moneylenders, but... Um, Sometimes things, opportunities like this show up too. This is, at the same time I'm doing paintings and, and mural painting, then my old friend Jonathan Losher, who was the same guy who commissioned me in Sacramento, he moved to Houstonsburg, Wisconsin, and he said, hey, there's a Wells of Mural initiative. We'd like you to do a mural. This is the spot. And I'm work, I work here, you know, I'm working here. And so I devised a plan to do it on wood panels, and I had them install it. And so it looks like this, and these are some of their kids. And they had a theme, and these are all wood panels with a, with a they had their, their local trustee install it for me. Um, Resurrection Lutheran saw an article that I did, that I did these paintings for Trinity. So they said, wait a minute, we, we want them to do some work for us. I don't know any of these people. I mean, I didn't know them until they came up to me. So this is at Resurrection Lutheran, and they said, well, do a scheme that would cover this whole section of wall. So I thought, okay, resur it's Resurrection Lutheran. I'd have to do another resurrection. Crucifixion, Lord's Supper, baptism, birth. Um, and that's what it looked like. I mean, this is uh, two blocks from my house. But at the time when they commissioned me, the pastor had just left the church, so they were pastorless. But the, one of the trustees had been in charge. So this was the, the resurrection that I had done for them. This one I actually had done first, before the one for Trinity. So it has some of the same elements, same landscape. But artists have done this all along when they need to. So then that was put in place. Pat Hall here at Bethany helped me with the framing and an installation. <clears throat> the second one, the crucifixion, I wanted to do a little bit different now. And I called it the crucifixion from a safe distance because I thought, if any of us were really there, how close would we go? How close would we be comfortable going to see the death of Jesus? And I thought, well, we'd be safely away, looking at it through a window or some kind of safe spot. And so I, I kind of dreamed up an aerial view of the crucifixion with some vivid colors, and I even included a... Uh, a skull. So that was part two. And then um, they wanted the Last Supper, so I needed the Last Supper. I went to my gang of Last Supper people, <laughs> and uh, I did add a few, but then that's, and then they stopped. They never did the, the last two panels, so I kind of feel like, wait, I, I was, I was going to do, I had more, but 
But you can walk by and look at it without even going in the church. It's a, it's a Missouri Synod. These are both Missouri Synod. They also... LCMC, okay. Whatever. <laughs> I did also um, a Luther seal for this church, this congregation, um, for their, one of their spaces. Then St. Peter Bell Church, the week of faculty workshop. Oh, we need this done right now. And so what they wanted was the front, this front wall and then here, and then over the organ. And they had a scaffolding set up. And I said, you know, I can't work from the scaffolding. He said, well, just do over the organ from the scaffolding. So they put a plank right here over the organ. Seriously, like a pirate plank. <laughs> and they said, here, we're all set, go. And I tried it for one day. And I, I spent the day truthfully in prayer, fully, all day. Please let me not fall to my death or to my serious injury because I'm standing here and trying to reach and I really can't reach because if you look, lean back, there's a big beam here. So I had talked to Randy and I said, you, you got to put at least a, a guardrail. And so he did. And it was still scary. Even the guardrail was like, oh, this could fall. So my choice was to fall back inside or down this front of these pipes and onto the furniture. And neither of those were very fun. And then I had to lift this up, raise this up, and then rag paint this. But they, you know what was really good about this project? When, well, I survived. That was one good thing. But when the trustee walked in, he was amazed. And he was so happy that I thought, oh, no, that's why I did it. He was so thrilled. Like, I've never seen a reaction to any painting I've ever done like this. I mean, he was genuinely wowed because I lifted this up and I did these clouds. You know, it's, it was a little mystifying, but very gratifying because I thought, okay, I risked my life to do this decorative painting, not my thing, but look at the reaction he gave me. And I thought that was enough to survive. And so currently working on a young Jesus in the temple and I'm plotting and planning something for Mount Olive. I'm nearly done with my 30 minutes. But uh, Ty Lyra, some of you might know him, he is my current Jesus. <laughs> and he loves, loves being Jesus. <laughs> and you can ask him about it if you see, I I'm actually surprised. I just put these up because, as I said, sometimes we forget what it takes to get to these, the point of the finished work. It's hours and hours of work and it's a long, long tradition. Um, since we have a time for questions later, thank you for your attention. I think that's my time. Has there ever been an artist that died while painting, falling? Uh, Michelangelo fell when he was working on the, on the Last Judgment, but he survived. I'm not sure. I think some of the assistants have died falling with a grinding paint or not paying attention. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, a woman that was here before Bill. Okay, Bill has really built Bethany's art department. It was started by Professor Edna Buzakist. I got to be her pastor in the final years of her life and do her funeral and things. She was a wonderful lady. In 1960-61 or so, Bethany really didn't have an art department. President Barney Teigen uh, at the time, wanted to, to get something started with this, and he contacted her. She lived in Rochester, New York, and she came out here and spent her whole career out here. A uh, wonderful, wonderful Christian woman, and uh, this is her teaching an art history class in the basement of the old library, so just wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge her. There's a couple of her paintings laying around here and there. She wasn't a fantastic artist, but she really did a lot to get things started. When Bill picked it up, it just took off after that, so... Miss B, yes, exactly, yep. She also taught home economics. So um, just to start out in regard to sanctify the arts, uh, let's, let's just uh, highlight a few of the things that we, we call principles of worship. Uh, recognizing the devastating consequences of the fall into sin on man, the gracious act of God in Christ to redeem us and to justify us, the need for faith to possess this treasure that we have, God's delivery system, 
that he's, been, that he's established in order to bring these gifts to us. And finally, a believer's response to God's grace and this free salvation. And if you think about the artwork that we just saw, the beautiful work that Bill's done, you could find, find uh, probably all of these in there somewhere in that work. And it's important for us as we think of sanctifying the arts, as in particular to the use in the church, uh, that, we, that we think about the, the central truths of Scripture and how important that is. Now, um, when I think about sanctify the arts, I think about how God himself, when he established the, ta the tabernacle worship during the great exodus, immediately calls upon artists and craftsmen uh, who are the best. They're looking for the best in order to, uh, to put things forward that would help um, uh, the service of the church, if you will, and the believers on their way through, uh, uh, through the, uh, the great exodus. Okay? Uh, likewise, the commissioning by God, if you will, of, of the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, think about the entire system, the, the temple worship as well, how visual that all was. Think how, how visual God made the worship life of the Old Testament believer. And so many of these things were typological pictures of the coming Christ. And uh, the, the whole plan of salvation was just, the more you study the history of of the Old Testament and, and the, their worship life. It's just amazing how God had all of these images, visual things that would help teach the, the faith of the, of the coming Messiah. It's just wonderful. Uh, when the temple is constructed, first of all by Solomon, then rebuilt and rebuilt again by Herod in Jesus' day, when Jesus was a, about a teenager or a college age student, um, the, the temple was being rebuilt in Jerusalem. Uh, the, the Jewish Talmud called it the most beautiful building in the world at the time. Uh, there were others that, that uh, spoke of it that highly as well. We think about little things like the ephod, the, the chest plate that the high priest would wear by God's command. And the idea was that, that each of these beautiful stones on that chest, uh, chest plate were to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And so when, when the high priest went and stood before God, maybe on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in the Holy of Holies, and, and was wearing this ephod, it was represent... Was it, wasn't he wearing it that day? Not that day. Oh, not that day. Okay, my bad. Okay, other days. Okay, my bad. So when he was wearing this before God, he was representing the people and a beautiful depiction of how Christ goes before, uh, before God on our behalf uh, as the great high priest, of course. So... Um, yeah, I'm glad Mark's here to correct my Old Testament theology. That's all right. Um, the, 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 the Jewish synagogue, likewise, if you look at a lot of the old designs of the synagogue, had a lot of beautiful imagery uh, connected with it. And um, uh, the, many of the ancient ones that we have in, into the early New, uh, early New Testament church uh, were told by Eusebius, the, the uh, church historian in the 300s, that James had very elaborate robes. Uh, very beautiful, colorful robes, um, and it was probably a carryover from the Old Testament worship life. Um, so visual things, I'm just trying to show you that visual things really, really seem to matter. Um, the New Testament church very early on as well uh, built baptismal fonts that, that had imagery in them. This one's really cool. So you would go down into, the, I think this one's in Ephesus, you would go down into the font and you would kneel in the water, it was maybe about six or eight inches deep, and um, right below you would be an image of the fall into sin. And the idea was that you, you would look down at, at why you needed God's grace because of our fallen nature. As you came up, there would be images and symbols of Christ and what Christ had done for us, that now as a baptized child of God, you are holy. So the church, the church figured out very early on how to utilize uh, the, the gifts of, uh, and put it right into mosaics and paintings and things. And even during the era of persecution, when the church went into hiding, uh, Christians found out, found ways. These weren't the best artists. This wasn't, this is not a Bukowski, okay? But they found uh, some artisan figured out a way to try to depict Christ. This is probably one of the earliest pictures or paintings of Christ uh, that we have, uh, that we know of anyway. Doesn't have a beard either, by the way. That's interesting. Then you get to the time of the Emperor, Emperor Constantine in the 300s, and Christ, uh, Christianity now becomes a legal religion. And he immediately sets artisans and craftsmen into motion to try to build bu more beautiful churches. Uh, he commissions that 50 special Bibles to be made on vellum uh, were to be created by the best calligraphers. 
And uh, uh, so the, immediately artists are employed by the church once, the, uh, once Christianity becomes a legal religion in the Byzantine Empire. Um, the famous uh, Grand Church in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, this, uh, this is a rebuild of it. The original church was burned down, and then in the 500s, uh, Justinian rebuilt it, Justinian I. So inside of it, is, uh, today it's, it was later converted to a mosque. Today it's just kind of a uh, museum, if you will. And, um, but uh, the idea was to, 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 uh, to show the grandeur of God and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the all-eternal nature of who Christ is. And uh, Christ was often depicted, um, Christus Pantocrator was often up um, in the nave of the church and uh, up above the, uh, the sanctuary. And um, Christ was, uh, this was at a time when Christ's deity was being challenged uh, by the controversy of Arianism and things. And so the art of the church uh, tried to reclaim and to make sure to put in front of people that Christ truly is the Son of God, very God of very God, begotten of the Father, and so on. So uh, this became a, a very prominent theme in many of the churches, to have Christ, the eternal Christ in the heavens, now sitting above you when you, when you came into church. And I always thought, when I was a ki- if I was a kid, is this how I want to think of Jesus? I don't know, he just looks a little ticked off, doesn't he? <laughs> But um, uh, so then as we, as we move on closer to the time of the early Renaissance, uh, we have the great split in the church, of course, between East and West. And uh, then we start to see probably in about the 1100s, the Stations of the Cross, where you could go and, and um, uh, meditate on, on the Passion of Christ and all the different stages of the cross. Giotto comes along and, and very, uh, very much humanizes the crucifixion of Christ. So you go from this, this uh, symbolic-looking Christ, very, very um, oh, I don't know what you'd call it, but uh, very stylized Christ that, that, were, were often, that was often painted up in the ceilings of the churches, and now you have this, uh, this very humanized Christ and to show the emotion of, of, uh, of all of this. And that kind of sets in motion a lot of changes that come with, uh, with the Renaissance. So I'm just kind of quickly, obviously, buzzing us through some time here. And uh, then we get to the time of the Reformation era and uh, uh, with, with Luther's involvement in this. So as, as Bill pointed out earlier, Luther initially despised the visual arts. And uh, uh, he, be, he saw them as, the reason he didn't like them is because uh, people were often, patrons would come forward to the church and say, I'll pay for a painting or a statue as long as I can get some time off of purgatory for this. And so because it was connected to that, uh, the, the system of the purgatorial stuff, um, Luther despised this, and he, he kind of almost wanted to shut it all down. But then uh, the second wave of the Reformation, you had uh, the iconoclasm that came in with some of the radical reformers who wanted to uh, completely get rid of any imagery in the churches and things. And uh, because it was, it was smacking too much of, of, of Roman Catholicism. And Luther realized, well, that's not right either. And, and that kind of caused a little bit of a shift in his thinking to want to hold on to some of this. So the next movement was to kind of reclaim the art of the church and maybe, um, maybe reinterpret it. So if there, were, if there were depictions of saints, rather than saying we should pray to them, which scripture doesn't command us to do, he would instead put up a saying about the saint that was focused on Christ. And that was a way that many of these uh, previous uh, Roman um, sanctuaries were suddenly reclaimed and, uh, and the, the artwork was reclaimed for the gospel. Um, and then finally, um, he saw that art must be used in service to the word and um, uh, that, that, that there is a, a proper purpose for it but it has to be seen as a primarily instructional thing. So that was more Luther's perspective on this. Um, not all Lutheran artists followed entirely with this thinking after that, uh, but that was really kind of Luther's perspective on all this. I happened to get a chance to sit and talk with Luther and Katie and Melanchthon. This, this is a, there's, a, there's a restaurant down in the basement of the Wittenberg Church. And uh, you can sit and have a conversation with them. And they didn't have a whole lot to say, but so anyway. 
All right, I don't know why my fonts are all messed up. Something happened here. So now I just want to make a quick comment, a commentary about the iconoclasm that was practiced to, to get rid of all this imagery. And that really started to dominate um, uh, a lot of Calvinistic thinking and so on. And, and many sanctuaries became very cleansed of art, okay? And this was a big movement then that came over to the United States. And so a lot of the early settlers uh, brought with them sort of this type of thinking regarding the arts. But it was completely different from a Roman Catholic perspective and actually from a Lutheran perspective as well. So when Lutherans first came to the United States, they started building churches with beautiful altar pieces, very ornate and things that looked like this, up until about 1920. And then in the 1920s, um, I believe there was a large surge of Roman Catholics coming over from Ireland and Poland and other places. And some think that Lutherans began being a little bit afraid of looking too Catholic. And so from the 1920s on, you often see sanctuaries that look a little bit more like this, which were a little more bland and, and kind of downplayed the ornate nature uh, that was often seen. Now, um, uh, I personally think that uh, it, was a, it was a response to try to appear more sort of reformed and Calvinistic, uh, to not appear too Roman Catholic, okay? And you can see this in a lot, this happens in a lot of different places, okay? My grandfather, John Molstead Sr., many, many years ago, uh, wore a collar, a clerical collar, up until about the 1920s, and then suddenly started dressing like a Baptist pastor. And you see this with a, with a lot of things too, okay? Um, in a lot of other ways. So here's a pre-1920s sanctuary, here's a post-1920s sanctuary. Lutheran church is both, okay? Uh, once again, I think this one's down in, is that in St. Louis? And then this. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. There's, there's nothing sinful about it or anything. But there is something that changed a little bit. There's something that, a uh, perception that in, among Lutherans, I think, as far as how to decorate our churches and, and things that, that we've sort of lost. And it's nice to see some of that liturgical art coming back, at least in my opinion. Now, I wanted to talk briefly about um, how, the, how the arts can be used to present a faith, a Christianity, with, with real substance to it. And in order to get to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about some things with um, millennials and uh, Gen Zers and so on. So Christian youth today who have left the church basically have said spiritual matters were not taught to them with any substance. It appeared to be shallow. Okay? It didn't seem like it, it could hold up to the scrutiny of the world. Um, according to uh, when did doubts begin when, when they would ask this question to people who've left the church, okay? who were once Christians and have left the church, uh, starting in college, only about 10% of them said it did. In high school, about 44%, and in middle school, about 40%. Uh, a lesson for all of us, and that is, we got to get to our young people earlier than college to make sure we're teaching them substantive theology and that they're really, that they're really learning to grapple with a lot of the tough issues that they're going to be hit with uh, out into our culture and in our secular world. Okay? Now, I just want to point something out. Okay? I took some of the picture books that I had when I was a child and being raised in the faith in the 1960s, and I just depicted some of the art, okay, that was being used to teach me about my Savior. Okay, take a look at that. And now this is what our kids get today. Okay, what does this say about the substantive nature of the Christian faith? It's, it's put on the same level with SpongeBob, pretty much, okay? And from a kid's perspective, that, that degrades the, the seriousness, okay? Just look at that difference again. And this is very common. If you look at our VBS materials and some of our Sunday school materials, uh, this is what's being often produced out of, uh, out of Concordia, even Northwestern Publishing House, and so on. There are a few good things, but you've got to really look for them. Okay? Here is one of the most popular, a couple years ago, most popular VBS things among Lutherans. For Where's Jesus on here? Find Christ on here. It'll take you a minute. You'll, you'll get there. Okay, where's Christ? There's one message of Jesus up here, okay? And I suppose you could say there's a Bible down there. Um, this, the, this is just take this, I call it the Disneyfication, the Disneyfication of the Christian church. 
And I believe it has really harmed our young people. I believe it's caused a lot of young people to grow up thinking this stuff is shallow. This stuff is on the same level with all the little trinkety Disney stuff that I get when I go to McDonald's and get a little Happy Meal. And I think that's done a great disservice to the church. Okay? All right. Hey, you asked me to speak. I'm going to tell you what I think. Okay. <laughs> now, I want you to think about this from a child's perspective, okay, in a child's eye, if I can get this to come up. When they would go to, a, uh, when they would go to the temple back in, in Jesus' day, for instance, it was very unique from all the other things you did in life, okay? It was not entertainment. You clearly saw it wasn't entertainment. It certainly wasn't Disney World. You could tell by what was going on there that this matters, and it was of the highest importance. It was otherworldly, and you were now in the presence of God. And that became very reflective in where you worshipped and how you worshipped and what you saw in your temple worship life and everything, okay? When a if you think about when a child would go to a, a church service. So here's maybe one of my takeaway thoughts. If our relationship to God is to be taken seriously, then the visual and musical arts must convey this. We must make sure to convey that with the art that we use as well. Okay, then I was just going to show you some of, the, uh, some of the things. I don't know if this, something's not working right here. These are some of the paintings that I've done through the years that um, uh, Hannah asked me to show a little bit of my art. So I've been uh, blessed to go on a number of uh, trips. This one was to Germany. It's a very horrible picture. I think the Marzoffs own that one. That's uh, one, of the, one of the churches down in, uh, uh, out in uh, Dresden, if I remember. Uh, Bill had a number of us do a, uh, an art show about seven, eight years ago with uh, drawing and I always loved this shot. This was an alley scene right below Mount Al or Bethany, I'm sorry. And uh, when I was a kid, I would drive my bike down that alley, and I always loved that window. I, and then the steeple off to the side. I always thought that was so neat. That's St. Pete's and Paul's, of course. This was a, a drawing I did for my daughter's wedding for her bulletin cover. And uh, my kids asked me to come up with a baptismal certificate for our family, for our kids. So I put that together. All of them have those. Um, a lot, I've done a lot of church drawings up in uh, Duluth because I had a sister and brother-in-law, sister-in-law, brother-in-law that lived up there, and we'd spend a lot of Thanksgivings up there. And this was a cover I was asked to do for the Hebrews Bible study that our synod put out uh, a number of years ago. Just a few other of my drawings through the years. And you think of the powerful imagery that God uses in, uh, and, and, and likewise, when Christ would speak and, and preach and teach, he would often create images in your mind. And you know, I'm the good shepherd, and I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, so God clearly uses the visual aspect of who we are as people in our minds and our eyes to, uh, to relate uh, the gospel to us and to, to bring his truth to us. This was what I did years ago in seminary for a, um, um, a Bible study on the life of Christ, Bill Kessel wrote. This, by the way, is the church in Milwaukee where uh, the Synodical Conference, Missouri Synod, ELS, and Wells, first put themselves together in whatever year that was, 1870-something, I forget, 78 or 6 or somewhere, okay? So um, it's still technically a Wisconsin Synod church today. Beautiful, ornate uh, steeple there. I apologize for this. Um, when, I, when I came to Mount Olive to be pastor, um, the, uh, the bulletin covers that's, that had been purchased had kind of a reformed influence to them, and uh, w there was often a confusion of, of different things. There would be something about that in Christ we have freedom, and it would be a picture of the American flag and an eagle, you know, something like that. It's like, that's not the freedom we're talking about. And uh, so I decided, I decided to start drawing a few uh, bulletin covers, and, and, um, and here's maybe my point with this, too. Um, unlike these other gentlemen, and every, I think everybody you'll have tomorrow too, they are all professional artists that have pursued this as a career. I have not. And, and yet, uh, you can still use the gifts that you have in order to serve the church, and, uh, and, and likewise, not just serve the church, but beautify people's homes and lives too. So um, 
Uh, you don't have to be a, a paid artist in that sense to do that either. This was one I was asked to do for, it actually was started as a cover for the religion class here at Bethany years ago. I think you guys asked me to do that. And then I turned it into a little bit different uh, drawing from there. This is the steeple over at MLC or DMLC when I was young. And uh, it's one of the ways that I get to relax is to go sit and draw a little bit here and there. This one on the Trinity. This is kind of cool, by the way. So one day I'm, I'm looking for a, 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 an image, a visual to use for our bulletins here on the Trinity. So I just you know, entered into Google, you know, Trinity image or whatever. And I think, uh, I think mine came up like number 10 out of all. I thought, hey, well, that's pretty cool. So it's probably not there anymore. <laughs> so, and the sword of the spirit. Uh, this is one of my few oil paintings. I, uh, and I'll, I'll make a comment about that too, but um, I think Bukata Hayes owns this one, Bukata and Lisa. Uh, this is the uh, St. Thomas Church in, and the tower in Leipzig where um, Bach did uh, most, of his, most of his great works and things uh, when we were over there for, the, um, uh, for a trip to the, uh, on the Reformation sites. Um, in my case, because I... I just don't have as much time to put into doing artwork as I would like. Um, I, there have been times I've, think, I've thought, oh, I'm going to try to really get into oil painting. I want to be like Bill someday. And I never quite get there. I, so if you really want to get bummed out, go and paint with Bill. Because <laughs> we, we, we'd go to the park together, and, and I'd set up my stuff, and Bill'd set up his stuff. And about a half hour later, I'd look over, and he's almost done. And I've got like four lines, you know, and a leaf, you know, a leaf down here. So. Anyway, he works so fast. But um, what I was going to say is uh, I, I finally realized after a while, even though I had some oil paints and a canvas, or I mean a, a, um, uh, all the stuff for it, I just wasn't going to have time to do it and a place to do it. So I kind of realized I'm going to try to just stay with the things that hopefully I can do well and do a little bit of. And uh, for me, that was, that was kind of an accommodation to where I'm at in my life and, and things like that. Someday, maybe when I retire, I'll, uh, I'll be able to get back to doing things like oil painting, but um, it's, it is a whole different, uh, whole different realm than watercolor or, or just pen and ink. Um, I also, once in a while, sometimes I'll even do these during meetings, and I'll be sitting and doodling, and I'll try to turn them into ornate crosses that we can use, you know, in our bulletins here and there and stuff. So if you ever see these, you'll think, yeah, Molstead wasn't paying attention during a meeting. That's probably where it came from. So, yeah, <laughs> this is my one shot, uh, one, one attempt at trying to do some more Eastern or Byzantine type art. So when I was over in Ukraine one year teaching vacation Bible school, um, they didn't have any painting on their altar. And I said to them, if you'd like, I could try to you know, paint some kind of picture of Christ. And they said, well, yeah, but if you could do it in a more Eastern style, you know, that would be good, like iconic and stuff. So it didn't turn out very well from their perspective. The, a couple of the members, when they saw it, they said, well, thank you for doing it, but it looks like somebody from the West tried to paint something from the East. <laughs> said, well, you got it. So they're still using it over there in there. What's funny is the night that I paint, or painted this, I was staying with a family, tiny little bedroom, and um, I, I, to get this painting to dry, I had to set it down under a desk, and um, uh, there was hardly any room in the, in the house. And um, anyway, that, uh, the next morning I got up and there were smears all over it. I had to redo some things. I was like, what, did, what happened? And here I, I came out later and the, the, the family's dog was sitting there and its tail had paint on it. <laughs> the, the dog had snuck in during the night and slept next to the painting. <laughs> so whenever I look at this painting, I think of a dog with blue paint on its tail. Everybody's a critic. Yes, everybody's a critic, right? This is funny. I got to show you this. So when I was a student at Mankato State, way before computers were used for it, which Art, Andy will get into next, they asked us to do a logo for some company or something. And I thought, well, this would be fun. I'll try to do a logo for Bethany. And uh, tried to come up. It's longer than this. I couldn't take a bigger picture of it. But tried to come up with a, a logo for Bethany. And what's, what's really funny is if you get close to it, you can probably see it from where you are, it all had to be drawn in with markers and everything, you know. And, and it's all scratched in. And anybody who works with computerization today would be like, wow, holy old school. So um, I uh, 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 submitted this to the, the hymn book committee years ago and was 
actually surprised that they used it for the logo. I was very, very pleased with that. And it's fun to see that on the, on the hymn books. My little grandkids finally found out that I was the one that designed the logo on the hymn book. And the first Sunday that we were sitting in church with them up in Minneapolis, my grandson was maybe four or five, and my wife was explaining, Grandpa did this on the hymn book, they did this thing. And he starts looking around the church, and he goes, you did all of these? <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cute. <laughs> all right, so uh, we'll have time for some questions later on. So I'll turn it over to Andy. Sola Deo Gloria. Do you have something on here? Oh, yeah, I guess so. I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint. Uh, I thought about doing that this morning, but to cover everything, visuals as well as verbals, it wouldn't take me until tonight sometimes to get that. So we'll have to do some of those Lutheran word pictures that we were talking about. Um, thanks to Hannah for putting this all together. I mean, this is pretty much all we're doing. And uh, let's check this now and see that door. Turn it off for you. So I didn't really know what we were doing. Again, I, I'm gratified that we're not repeating ourselves too much. But uh, um, I. It's not like, what's the big deal? We're all doing art. You know, why do we have to sanctify anything? You know, we're not doing sanctify the mathematics. And we're not doing sanctify, you know, physics or something like that. What is it about art that, that de requires us to sanctify it somehow? And, and the end result is, on some level, at least in a, to a conservative sensibility, art is toxic. And I think that's why, that's why in the 20s, Lutheran churches and other churches move away from visual stuff. It wasn't that the churches were changing so much, in my opinion, but that the art had changed. The art had left the church and just about everybody else behind and went on to do whatever it wanted to do. So... Um, why is art different? Why aren't we having sanctify, uh, you know, uh, English lit? I mean, there's certainly enough depraved people in English literature, I'm sure, that, that would, it would warrant a, a conference. But, uh, so there are some ways that art is the same as everything else, and some, some ways that art is very different. Uh, how is it the same? The same, it's like, it's like any other uh, activity undertaken by human beings, which means like any other activity undertaken by human beings, it can be corrupted and spoiled and ruined. We're all sinful people, and this is what happens. You know, this is what happens in politics and business and, and everything. Where, where freedom exists, so does corruption. There are more web, websites donated to pornography than any other subject on the internet. You know, we're free to look at whatever we want, but this is what human beings like to do. So in that way, I suppose, uh, art is different because um, it's public. Everybody sees it. In, in, in some ways that's good where uh, an artist has a show and you're inviting everyone to come in. Look what I did. And we're all supposed to look at it and we're all supposed to participate somehow. And, and so on, in some cases that's good because uh, it's democratic, you might say, but it's also bad because you get a lot of people who start talking about art who, who don't really know what they're talking about sometimes. And, and so because it's so public, because it's so democratic, we all think we have a stake in it somehow. We all, architecture, we all walk in a building like this, we all have an opinion about, do we like, is this building good or not? You know, it's that kind of thing. And so uh, that's why we're having it sanctify the arts, because in, it, unlike physics, which is really enjoyed by a small number of people, there, the, art is something that uh, people have a need for. And I think even today, people have uh, an aesthetic sensibility that has to be satisfied. Uh, the story I tell recently is the most artistic experience I've had in the last year was going to a Vikings game. Because uh, there was, uh, in the, what, four hours I was at the stadium, there was about 20% football and the rest was theatrics, right? There were pyrotechnics and videos and music and dancing, you know, smoke and all this kind of stuff. That's all art. That satisfies everybody on, a, on an aesthetic sense. And, but if you ask that same crowd of people at the Vikings game, well, let's go to the, the Institute, the Minneapolis Institute of Art next. How many w people would want to go? Because, so, it's not that the aesthetic impulse has been driven out of society. We still have it. We just satisfy it in other ways. At the movies, 
We listen to music. We have all these things. 150 years ago, you would read poetry. Who, reads, who read a poem this week? Anybody? Okay, you guys don't come. <laughs> so there are, there are two points I'd like to make today, I guess, as I think about sanctifying the arts. The first is there's nothing intrinsically evil or corrupt about making art. Period. It's an activity just like any other, peri- any other activity. Some people are blessed with skills in numbers, and they're accounting whizzes. Some people are, are, dressed, are blessed with spatial reasoning skills, and they construct buildings and sculptures and whatever. And some people have a, a, a desire to draw or paint or make, make things. Right? It's a creative impulse that I think everybody has to a certain extent, um, but not everybody develops it, perhaps, to the extent that some artists do. So um, that's the first point. There's nothing intrinsically evil about art, and, and despite of what conservative Lutherans might have to say. And I, and I think... Uh, our con- when, when Bill shows up at, at an ELS meeting and says, I want to put a painting in, 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 at Mount Olive, there's a portion of our constituency that just says, nope, because we know about artists, wink, wink, right? Or, or, or actors, right? Or novelists. You know, we've got this whole list of people that get categorized in a certain way. Why? Well, these things are stereotypes that sort of have some basis in reality. The second thing I'd like to talk about is... Art is downstream from culture. Artists would like to tell you that we are the creators of culture. And it's surprising to me as a design teacher that graphic designers as a group tend to think of themselves as the creators of society. It's really quite strange because people outside of design circles, they would laugh and what are you talking about? But artists, designers, they like to think about themselves as creators of culture and society when at best I would argue that they contribute they, uh, they spread ideas, they make ideas more popular, right? But they don't produce the ideas themselves by and large. Um, so, for an example, I, I learned recently, I was watching a, a documentary on Impressionism, and I always thought, I sat through all the undergraduate classes and the graduate school classes in art history, and I thought, what made Claude Monet decide to paint like that? Didn't anyone else think to go outside and paint outside? And why does he come up with these cool little brush strokes? Why didn't anybody? Well, it turns out that Impressionism, as much as anything, was made possible by the development of the steam engine and the locomotive that could take people to distant places. The portable easel, where you could put your studio in a box and take it with you. The, the, the thing called the ferrule that's on your paintbrush. It's that little metal piece that turns the brush from a round bundle of bristles to a flat bundle of bristles. Something as silly as that. And of course, the invention of the tube, the paint tube. Prior to the tube of paint, you had to carry your paints around in pig's bladders. Who wants to, who wants to go out for a picnic? Let me get my pig's bladders out and we'll have a painting. No, it's, so nobody could have been an Impressionist before the Impressionists were for reasons entirely separate from, from what we call creativity. They're actual practical things. So that's a real simple example. But otherwise, where does culture come from? If art is downstream from culture, where do these ideas come from? And so uh, for, well, I have some, uh, I, I have a, a, an interest, a longstanding interest. I went back and I looked at my uh, Master of Fine Arts thesis that I wrote in 1991. And the topic of that was, why do artists create things? And at the time, the only thing, this was pre-internet, it was like the dark ages, but before, uh, the only thing I could really find were psychologists. Freud had a lot to say about why artists create things, and none of them were very flattering. Uh, and so, <laughs> most of them were like, what? No. Okay, so, um, but now there's been lots of, there have been books written about it, and, um, which I find very interesting. So, uh, where does culture, so I'll talk a little bit about historically where does culture come from and what happened to art over the years. Um, so, because it's an interest of mine and I can talk about what I want. Like. So, for, for in Western art anyway, for uh, thousands of years, there were three things that motivated artists. The one was transcendence. Uh, since the ancient Greeks, there's a belief that there's a spiritual world and a, and a transcendent world that Art is one way, theoretically, to bridge and to glimpse the infinite in the finite, right? So art is, you know, religious art is a great example. We're supposed to see a painting, yes, but we're supposed to think loftier thoughts. 
the Hagia Sophia is the best example. Um, the second thing that motivated artists was, was beauty. Even when they were painting ugly things or scenes of ugliness, they were doing it in a way that was richly textured and beautifully colored and all this kind of thing. Beauty, the ability to make something aesthetically uh, attractive was a big deal. Okay? And the third thing uh, that I'll point to is that art was meant to be universal. The idea that uh, anybody could look at a painting and if it was good enough, anybody could get something out of it. When you go to the museum, in Minneapolis and you see The Death of Lucretia by Rembrandt and you sit and contemplate this poor woman who's, who is just, she's in the act of killing herself and this sorrow that's captured in her face. It, it, unless you're some sort of a uh, stone, you, you're moved by it at, on some level. So there's, there's a universal human uh, at, uh, theater, theater being played out in a picture like that. Okay, so transcendence, beauty, and universality were the things that, that drove art for a long time. So what happened? Um, we, we uh, beginning, just think of uh, the, the person credited with the invention of the Gothic style right prior to the Renaissance was Abbot Suger, right? Am I saying that right? You can say Abbot Sugar, but that just doesn't seem right. So in his, his quote was, I even wrote it down, the dull mind rises to truth through that which is beautiful. You know, so he's, he's the guy responsible for the Gothic movement which built Notre Dame and all these great cathedrals that are supposed to be beautiful because it's through beauty. God is seen as a, as a, as a, a mathematician. And geometry is the language of creation. And so our churches have to be beautiful. And so um, the Renaissance shows up. We see humanism. God is less important. The individual becomes more important. We can thank Luther a little bit for some of that, can't we? The... the Emphasis on the individual as opposed to the corporate in, in worship. And so we take that, and of course, like all human ideas, it runs. It just keeps going beyond where everyone expects. And so in walks uh, the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, and suddenly the world is not a, a, a creation by God anymore. The world is a giant machine, and it runs by itself. No God required. And so, again, take that to its logical conclusion. There is no God. There is no transcendent purpose whatsoever. And so... Artists beginning around 1800 and certainly in the 19th century throughout, we throw out this idea that God exists and that art has anything to do with him. So, number one purpose of making art is that it's transcendent. It's, it bites the dust because there is no transcendence. What you have is a material, physical world that doesn't care about you or your feelings or even what you are. You are it's deterministic. Uh, don't, don't think about the fact that this destroys creativity. The idea that you can come up with an idea of your own and make it interesting. No, you are simply reacting to the world around you, much like a rabbit or a dog. And that's what a human being is. So artists, there goes a third of what dro drove art for a millennia. Second, um, so, so the Enlightenment brings in science has been, uh, science then becomes a contributor of both the advancement of the human race. I like antibiotics, you like antibiotics. But it's also the, the killer of the human soul, right? Richard Dawkins and, and Charles Darwin would have you believe that you are nothing but a pile of meat. And there's a computer in your brain made out of meat and it does what it does and you have nothing to do with anything. It's the death of creativity. And so enter the romantic movement. The romantics were the backlash against this big mechanistic view of the, of the universe. And they said, no. It's the human being that takes sense data and makes, makes sense of it, right? And it, it's got to be about feeling and emotion and turmoil. And, and, and it's, it's not that the world is telling, it's forcing you what to do. It's now the artist is taking the world and forcing it in to do what he wants it to do. And so I will express because I'm an artist, right? And that's my job. I'm a poet. And this is the rise of, of the big poetry, big movements in music and theater, right? That, that, uh, that push back against this notion like you're just a meat bag and you are a creative autonomous agent, right? But again, human beings take that to its logical extreme, which is I'm God, right? I'm creating the universe. I'm imposing order on the world. And so uh, we have this further notion that, well, the problem with the romantics is they get out of control and they start, and art becomes a religion. And there were many artists who talked about it in religious terms, and, and, and the art is the priest, or the artist rather, is the priest in the religion of art. And so 
I'm going to be transcendent. Art is going to bring us all. Kandinsky was the guy. Art was going to bring us all to this uh, transcendent view of the universe, and artists will lead the way. And th I have plenty of motivation to think that way because I'm an artist. And so I am going to lead the way to this thing. And if I have to take a few hits of LSD to do it, all the better. If, you know, all you plebes down there with your bourgeois morality, uh, you, don't, you don't apply to me, right? So we start to run into these stereotypes of the bohemian artist who drinks all the time or smokes all the time or, does, or sleeps around, right? This is where Freud came in. He thought, he thought artists, his motivation for art, he said, was to have more beautiful lovers. Period. <laughs> like, thanks, Sigmund. But, so, so the problem, we've got, you've got the, what we'll call the rationalists or the empiricists on one hand, and the romantics on the other hand, is that they're both pagan. And the, the question is, what happened to the church in the 18th century? It's like, why didn't the church stop this and say, no, this is, this is all craziness. God is responsible. And, and um, there's a great book uh, by Jean Edward Veith called uh, State of the Arts. And he asks that question, why didn't the church stop this? And he says that the church, by and large, forgot that God works through means. Luther and the idea of vocation is that we are God's hands through the world. And, and when, the, uh, when the Enlightenment says, no, God doesn't make it rain, it's condensation and air pressure and, and humidity and blah, blah, blah that makes rain. So we don't need God. Well, the, prop, the, the church should have said, well, where'd you get your condensation? Where'd the moisture come from? You know, who makes, you know, who set up the system? But no, they were, they were kind of absent. The church really didn't do much to fight this. So you've got two prevailing ideas in art and culture, the determinists and the romantics, and they're both pagan. And so why should we be surprised when the rest of culture, the, those, those of us with a more conservative sensibility, start to move away from what they're talking about and what they're doing? And so this is one of the reasons. So, um, so, so we lost transcendence, right? What do we lose next? Um, where am I? So beautiful. One of the things, one of the tip, the the, uh, the main characteristics of what we call modernist art or modernism is that um, since there is no more transcendent uh, plane of existence, we can't really talk about transcendent beauty. And really, let's be honest. In is there much beauty in the world? Art, to be honest has to be about art. So there's a term in art called formalism, which, which means that um, the, the subject of a painting is the painting. It doesn't matter what the painting is of. It doesn't matter what colors are there. The, the, the subject of the painting is color, texture, brushstroke, uh, shape. And so we see a, uh, a push now towards abstraction. And this is where most of the students, we go to the walker every year, and every, every, so every year, at least three or four people come walking out. That was stupid. Because, right? Because you've, if you've been to the walker, you walk in, you see a square with a red circle in it, and someone is there telling you how important this is in very hushed tones. That's a very important painting. And you're, you're like, what am I missing here? And, well, the fact is you're missing a lot. There is a reason why that circle and the square are put there, Except they don't bother to tell you that because it takes time to learn that stuff. And so once you understand it, there is some context and there is some rationale behind it. So it's not stupid, right? But on the other hand, it's mystifying. And the thing, as it, it occurred to me a few years going in the walker from, Bill's been there 80 times, 70 times, something like that. Um, this is my 40th time, maybe. Uh, I walked in and, and it struck me that we're all walking around in very hushed tones. And we're looking at these paintings. Oh, that's one. Don't touch it. No, don't touch it. I think we move in the next room. What occurred to me, we weren't in a museum at all. We were in a temple. You're in a religious place. And the God that they're worshiping is us. Hey, let's, let's put up this great painting. Aren't I terrific? I made this giant soft pack of French fries. It's 20 feet tall. And, everyone, and, and, and you walk in, and a normal a child would walk in and say, what's this all about? There's a French fries. Let's go eat. But you can't do that. You're told, quiet, this is important. Don't you know how important this is? And part of you says, okay, yeah, it's important. It's a historical artifact, but it's French fries. Really? This is where we are? Yes, this is where we are. So you've taken the idea that art has to be about beauty, and artists, this is what gets me, is artists intentionally 
stopped doing that. They said, art shouldn't be about beauty. The world is a terrible, ugly thing. So any beauty, we're not worried about beauty. You know, Robert Hughes has a quote. He says, he's an art, art critic of some fame that Bill loves. He says, the story was that there was no story. This art is not about anything. You look at, you look at that, and it looks like maybe a dead, a dead bullfighter, Manet, but it's not about a dead bullfighter. The story is the paint. Look at the texture. Look at the color. You know, look how he takes him out of, anyway, there's a lot you could go into. Um, so there's no transcendence anymore. There's no effort to be beautiful anymore because that's not what art is about. It's not what it's for anymore. And the third one, the third one that bites the dust is its universality. So you've got the sort of the, the uh, determinists on one side and the romantics on the other side and they separate. And somewhere, in my opinion, in somewhere in the early 20th century, they sort of reconverge. And the thing that comes out of that is it's a modernist idea, um, art for its own sake, but a big one is artist as, art as expression, right? I'm, if you asked any studio art major at MSU today, why are you a painter? They would say, I want to express myself. <laughs> and for a while, that's awesome. After 20 or so years of watching students express themselves, you're like, could we, we could do with a lot less expression <laughs> because we're expressing ourselves all over the place. You know, do we have to do this again? And yes, the answer is yes, because that's what art is about. It's about self-expression. It's not about transcendent truth, because there's no transcendent truth. It's not about transcendent anything, because there's no transcendent anything. It's about me telling you the way it ought to be. And this is Andy Warhol. He, he does these soup can things, and we all scratch our head. What is he doing? He's nagging us. You eat too much soup. You buy too many things. You look at TV commercials. You know, artists are wagging their finger at you. They are the new moralists of our culture for anyone who happens to be listening to them still. The thing is, fewer and fewer people are listening to them. And we wonder why the walker is empty every time we go there. There's 20 people in this giant big museum. Because nobody cares. Because it's not that they don't care about art, because they do. They go to the theater sometimes. They love movies. They love TV. They love all these things that satisfy that aesthetic impulse. But the walker isn't doing it for them. So they don't go there. So, and why should they? It's not universal, it's not beautiful, it's not transcendent. It's just a thing. It's a thing that weird people do, <laughs> right? Because that's a stereotype that's remaining. So why shouldn't the church run, run away? You know, why shouldn't we all run away? Uh, I have another theory that what happened to art in the 18th century, the re, the, what we would call transcendent, meaningful stuff, um, there, there's, a, there's a whole other vein <laughs> of art, no, we won't go there. Um, I don't have time. Um, so, the, in summary, the, the question is, uh, what do we do about it? Every art student today has to somehow resolve the fact that they're interested in this subject. I wanna paint pictures, because it's so fun. Okay, well, do you realize you're moving into this area of human endeavor that has no rules? You could put up a square with a circle, and everyone in the room is gonna say, hmm, that's interesting. And inside they're saying, oh, that's really, it's kind of boring. It was new 80 years ago, but okay, it's interesting. And so there are no rules. So how do you, how do you, you know, the way I see it, there are two people, two kinds of people who do art today. Three. <laughs> I'm making this up as I go. The first that comes to mind are guys like Bill. Bill loves to paint. I've gone out with Bill to the park too, and I, um, I'm a victim of 20th century pop culture. My attention span is about this long, right? And this is why I love computers, because I can make something in a couple of hours that's done, right? I go out with Bill, and two hours later, I'm like, God, are, we, are we done yet? What's going on? You know, I'm hungry. And so it... Don't ever go painting with me. <laughs> either day and night, we won't get anywhere. So, so some people just love it. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. You should do what you love to do. I think we should all do what we love to do. That's, that's the great dream, right, we all have. So a second type of person is, is a second type. Are they true believers? I think Eric Oren was a true believer. I don't want to drop names, edit that out. Um, uh, but Eric truly believed modernism was the thing. And he treated it very seriously. 
and uh, took it very seriously, and a trip to the walker was, was meaningful. And so there are people like that. You know, if you do your homework ahead of time, you can go to the walker and have a very rich, interesting experience. I don't know if you're going to be moved so much on an emotional level, but that's not what it's about anyway, so that's okay. It's, it's an intellectual exercise. Stephen Hicks is a philosopher uh, who I think is a professor at the University of Illinois. And his, the, the quote I read from him is he said, with the advent of modernism and now with postmodernism, art is not an activity, it's a philosophy. And it's a philosophy preoccupied with the question, what is art? And so that makes an awful lot of sense if, if you think about it, that artists aren't really exploring uh, universal, transcendent, beautiful truth anymore. They're exploring what in the world is art? If I walk in, can I say this is art? If I say it is, who's to say it isn't? And these are questions that, that, that occupy them all day long. There's a whole marketing thing. You do have to sell some things if you want to be a practicing artist. And so there's, I could go for another hour on uh, the art market and, and how kind of strange that is. But uh, every student has to come to grips with this. And they have to, they have to understand, you're, you're working in a field now that has no standards whatsoever. How does that make you feel? Do you want to be good? I would like to be good at what I do. Well, how do you know? How do you know you're any good at all when there are no standards? So my, for personally, my, my thing was to go down. You've got this divide between what I'll, what I'll generically put as fine art and commercial art. They both deal with the same subject matter, color, form, texture, shape, etc. But um, one is art for its own sake. We're just going to explore art. The other is art for a purpose, right? So my sensibility is I would like to do things that help other people get what they need done. I, want to, I would like to do things that get seen by a lot of people. I want to do things that have objective standards of quality where I can look at that and say, that's good. That did what it was supposed to do and it looked good doing it. I feel good about that, right? That answers it to me. That, that impulse that I have to make things gets answered better than that. For Bill, it, Bill loves painting. You know, the story I'll share about Bill is that he, he talks about, um, I, I talk about painting and I get all tense here and I, pretty soon my shoulders start to hurt. And I'm, okay, I'm done. Bill's like, oh, I don't get it. It's so relaxing, right? It's so relaxing. I sometimes drop the paintbrush and I'm like, <laughs> I don't get that. But here's the, 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 the benefit of an art world where anything goes. Literally, anything goes. Bill can do that. I can do my thing. You can do your thing. And it's all, at least on some level, legitimate. I, I do, my temperament lies with a commercial world where things can still be wrong. You did that thing, and it's all wrong. You've got to do it over. And here's why. And you can explain. You know, something like that. that that's a rational side that my brain has. Anyway, so my last thing I'll, I'll talk about is, is when Luther talks about vocation, art, art can be one of two things. It can be idolatry, and I've gone to art school with a lot of people who, uh, who are quite religious about art. And I mean religious in the real sense. It's a sacred thing they're doing. And it, in that sense, I can see that, yes, the walker represents a certain cultural idolatry because it's there to... Um, to tell us all how great we are. It's got nothing to do with God. Um, or art can be a vocation. And uh, Le for Leonardo, art was a vocation. For Michelangelo, art was a vocation. And the difference is this. Art as idolatry is me-focused. Everyone look at my work and tell me how great I am. Art as vocation is, I need to know what I can do for everyone else. If, if God has put me here to to be a service to other people. I am God's hands in the world. Whether you're a shoemaker or a baker or whatever, I have to be thinking about them and what can I do to help them. And so if we want to sanctify the arts, I think that's, that's the place to start. Is art is not about me. It's about art as a vocation, just like any other vocation, as parent, as employee, as a doctor, lawyer, whatever. Um, there's one other thing I want to say, but I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that, that sort of wraps it up. Um, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> so, thank you.
question. Um, I'm just going to start with a question. Um, I know you had said, oh, maybe I won't talk about that because we're short on time. So I was kind of curious if like, any of you guys um, like that being a thought or anything you felt like you wanted to really say but didn't get to cover um, in the 30 minutes and like that. Oh, that's dangerous to keep. <laughs> yeah, look on it. Oh, the thought I had in mind was talking about uh, art as a marketplace and uh, how, just economically speaking, the, the art market is such a weird, distorted thing because uh, when there are no rules of quality, uh, how can you establish the value of something? If one person says it's worth a million dollars and this other person says it's worth two dollars and neither of them have any rational, rational uh, explanation, how do you... How do you, the whole thing's artificial. It's like the diamond industry. <laughs> there's a lot more diamonds than we think there are. There's a lot of art out there as well. <clears throat> Things you wish you had time to say. Well, I think I covered it. <clears throat> one, one point that I would love to make, and it has to do with teaching art to children and youth. Um, and I, anytime I get to talk about this, I bring this up. So. Um, I believe the way I was taught art as a child, and maybe it's different today, but was basically recess with crayons at your desk. Yeah. That's what art was. It was just uh, put a piece of paper in front of you, we're going to make a valentine for mom, or we're going to make a turkey out of your hand or something. And <clears throat> the purpose of it was to almost kill time and, and make it easier for the teacher not to have to chase kids around the room if you sat at your desk doing something. And the, the, the general consensus was, I guess, that as long as you created something that you felt good about, that was going to be art. And in my case, anyway, I really was not taught any principles of art. I was not taught that there are some things that work and don't work, that there are uh, relationships that you should learn to understand in drawing and things. So <clears throat> this is my childhood bitterness coming out, but I never had anybody teach me any of this stuff when I was a child. Um, unlike math or history or any other subject, we know that you need to le learn this and then this and then this, but somehow we treat art differently when we teach children. We kind of feel, just let them go and do whatever they want, and then kids often get frustrated that they don't know how to draw and nobody taught them how to do perspective or the fact that your dog's head is bigger than your garage door you know on your picture I mean you need to correct those things in a nice loving way uh, we're so afraid of of stamping down someone's creativity that we we sometimes don't really teach anything too now I'm teaching and I'm talking in generalities and it could be art today in grade schools is a lot better than it was for me but um, I had to really struggle to learn things on my own and um, <clears throat> when I was pastor at Mount Olive, I would occasionally ask to take over it, and the teachers were often happy because they didn't know much about it either. And uh, I would ask if I could come in and teach some of the you know, basic principles of art. Um, so that's one thing as far as parents and kids too, I guess, is uh, don't feel bad about having to sit and give a critique to your child in a nice, gentle, loving way. That's how they're going to improve, just like they will with anything else. So I've said my piece. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm looking to answer any questions. Yes. I, I just had a thought about that one. Uh-oh. <clears throat> it's interesting, after teaching art for a long time, when you're trying to design a curriculum that, that an 18-year-old will connect with and will resonate with them and they'll learn something, it's, it's this weird, uh, it's a balancing act because you don't want to squash any kind of natural creativity and curiosity they have, but at the same time, they don't know anything. <laughs> they don't know anything. And, and so part of what a teacher's job to do is to lead that person to something valuable. They don't know it's valuable yet, but it's your job to persuade them. And for, for, my, for me, I had the same grade school art and my high school <clears throat> wasn't much better, but then I came to a place called Bethany and, and there was a guy there named Bill Bukowski and his big mustache and he said, he said, this is prehistoric art, we're gonna start here and it's important, pay attention. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and that's how, that's kind of what, where we all have to be taken somehow and and uh, whether that happens in grade school there's I don't know if there's a whole lot you can do in grade school there's not a whole lot you can do in college frankly because some people simply aren't ready to to intellectually grasp what you're talking about but um, you have to try I guess I have a few yes, things I can yes. say I think one of the things that as an artist 
that I would say, uh, and anyone in the arts, anyone who wants to be part of the, the club, the fellowship, and that includes theater, music, dance, all those aspects of design. It's not just an activity that you do. It's a lifestyle. You live it a certain way. It's not, oh, I think I'll, maybe I'll, I'm really bored. I think I'll paint. Well, that's not the way you approach it. It's part of your activity. It's part of your life. It's part of how you function. And when you don't, when you don't do it, then you're not feeling well. You're not feeling good. You're, you're off a little bit. And I don't know if it's something you learn to act like that or you learn to be like that, but anyone who wants to be an artist has to live that artistic life and make decisions based on that. I mean, we're thrilled that this many people came, made a decision to come today to, just to talk about it. But um, for the young people in the audience especially, it, you start now. You don't start when you're in college. You start right now. Can you define that further, Bill, like the artistic life? Um, the artistic life means that you spend your time, your free time, thinking about it or doing it. You design your vacations around your interest. <laughs> you um, are willing to work uh, towards your goals as an artist, whether you get paid or not. You're constantly dreaming up projects. You have a list of things you'd love to do as a professional or as an unpaid professional. And so it's, it's living an artistic life. You also, in my case, and I know Andy mentioned it once, but I do things that I feel will enrich myself as an artist. So I find theater enriching. I find theater like it gives back to me something that's really unique and that's necessary for me to, to continue as an artist. So I love to go to shows. Uh, music, live music, I think that's uh, essential. Uh, art house films. I, I have activities that are designed to reinforce my thoughts as an artist. Because in, in the real world, <laughs> uh, so many things dilute your, your passion. They dilute your, your commitment. And sometimes you don't have any money or you don't have a commission or you don't sell anything or you, no one pays you. I mean, one of the hard parts is if you're a plumber and you, you do your plumbing, someone pays you. Or if you're a doctor, you get paid, or a lawyer. If you're an artist, you might not get paid. You might never get paid. You might work your whole life and just say, well, I really enjoyed it. I wish I could have got some money for it. But that's part of it, too. You know, you do it whether you get paid or not, and it's just how you think and live. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick comment. The, um uh, w w listening to what you're talking about, how you're just kind of thinking of it all the time, and even vacations and stuff. I, I, Jason Jasperson's a great example of this to me, how he's constantly got a little journal sketchbook in his pocket or somewhere, and he's just got a, shelves and shelves full of these little sketchbooks. He's constantly thinking about and drawing and sketching and, and everything, and I, I love that. It's just, it just shows how it's just in you. And stuff too. And I, I can't claim to be like that. I try. When I go on vacations, I try to. My goal is to get a painting done every day on vacation, and or at least a good drawing or something. You know. Um, one other thing that uh, Bill, I heard Bill say this years ago to some students that that really stuck with me. <clears throat> there were some students talking about um, in one of his painting classes. I happen to be. I roam in there once in a while, and they were talking about how um, it was taking so long to get a painting done and. And uh, they only had, you know, the two hours of a studio class or whatever to do this. And Bill said, well, that's why you have to come back and work on it, you know, later and everything. And then they were kind of complaining about this. And he said, you need to go and watch the basketball players. After basketball practice is done, they stay there for another hour working on their free throws and things. And he said, you got to be committed to improving the talent you've been given. And, uh, you know, uh, put the time in and everything. That really, really hit me that day, so... That's good. Um, I'd like to clarify something because I've, I've been quoted on record as saying that art is a thing you do and not a lifestyle. And so uh, I want <clears throat> to explain why Bill and I are not uh, disagreeing. Uh, you notice that when Bill described the artistic lifestyle, there was not a word about wardrobe or hairstyle or, or body piercings, <laughs> right? <laughs> Bill's, Bill's describing lifestyle as 
It's just who you are. If this is something you are, just like a mathematician thinks math all day long, right? An artist will think art all day long, and they and they it it, it involves the center of their their thinking, right? And so when I say it's not a lifestyle, I'm talking about a lot of undergrads, maybe not Bethany so much, but elsewhere where. Uh, if I just get the right hairstyle and the right tattoo and the right piercing in the right place, I'm an artist because look at me, <laughs> right? That's a different thing. That's what I was talking about by lifestyle. Oh, um, hmm. so you guys were talking about art education, and actually I like the basketball quote because I was going to say something similar, but um, looking at art education and starting young and how we're not doing the best in our community, I see it like propagating more and more people that understand less and less about art. So when it comes time to choose paintings for a church, we've made a whole bunch of people that have no educational background, no knowledge. How do we shift that? How do you think we change that? Obviously we have to start when we're young. Otherwise, if we don't, if we don't make a radical change and start really young, we're gonna keep making more and more people that aren't artists and are filling our churches with things that are unpleasing. So <clears throat> when I was in seventh grade, uh, we had a, um, a lady that was our, um, a substitute teacher one day, and she knew a little bit about art. And <clears throat> I, we were supposed to draw a face, and I brought, brought my, my uh, completed work up to her, and she said, good job. Now look at my face. I looked at her, and she said, um, I noticed that on your drawing you have lines where the nose is. Do I have lines on my face where my nose is? And I said, no. She said, how do you know my nose sticks out? How do you know, how do you, how do you show that? And I said, well, by the light and the shadow. And she goes, draw the light and the shadow. That just like, to me, oh, opened up my whole world, you know? Um, <clears throat> and I think if, if we could get our teachers in the elementary level, you know, you did a great job in the high school level, you're doing that. Uh, in the elementary level to uh, to understand some just basic simple concepts too um, but when I think about you know who teaches typical art classes in an elementary school up through at least probably fifth sixth grade probably just if somebody has a little interest in it they might you know but it's it's usually somebody with no training in it at all and we don't do that in any other subject you know so um, it, it is incremental, but I think pointing it out, I've even done it with my nieces and nephews when we're on vacation or something. I'll just teach them little things, you know, about relationships in drawing or whatever. Another thing that I remember learning in college was uh, to draw negative spaces. When you're, when you're drawing something, look at the, the shape that's created by three objects combining together, and you're actually drawing air but draw the negative space. And it's like, that just blew my mind to look at it that way. It totally helped my, my perception of drawing. So um, <clears throat> some of those, and some of them aren't real difficult concepts once you learn them a little bit too. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but more on that. Marie, I saw you had your hand up. <clears throat> yeah, I was wondering if you have any encouragement for young artists, but also in that vein, how to how they should discern whether or not art is a full-time calling for them or more of a hobby and how do you decide that i guess mm -hmm. go i guess that i talk about this quite a bit with uh, <clears throat> students especially seniors who are who are about to graduate and and along the way where maybe am i should i be an art major should i be an art minor and that kind of thing <clears throat> and the end result is uh, God knows, but you don't. <laughs> and the best you can do on a daily basis, you can't do anything about the past, you can't do anything about the future. All you can do is decide what to do today. And um, you, when you tune into God's wavelength, so to speak, you, you trust him that the decisions you make along the way are the wisest. <clears throat> and as long as you're on his wavelength and you're sort of in his, in his camp, so to speak, you've got a certain confidence that's, that those, those decisions are the best. Now, he... He's got a plan, and he knows what it is. Um, getting getting you to that place where he wants you will happen, <laughs> right? And we don't. Your calling may be in art. There's, I mean, is there anything wrong with that? And we we this we have this reflexive nature. I had a, a classmate of mine on Facebook, 
that made a comment. Uh, her son or daughter was really getting into art in high school, and she was scared by that. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just almost like she was talking about she was getting into drugs or something. And I, and I thought, you know what I do for a living, right? And, and so you, you, all you can do is pray that the t decisions you're making now are the right ones and trust him to take care of you. And you work on the tools he's given you to the very best. This is where uh, the students have to be encouraged. No matter what you do, you have to do the very best you can do it all the time. And then, pretty soon, your talent in art turns into a real talent that turns into something that's an undeniable thing. That This is where I'm being led. And that's, I don't know, the best I can describe it. I've always been leery of the word hobby. <clears throat> It's kind of, in my language, that would be like a, a swear word, maybe. <clears throat> but I think uh, the, the main ingredient for any artist in any walk of life is passion. You can have a lot of talent, but if you don't have the passion for it, you don't have to worry. The world is cruel enough. They'll uh, stop that person from becoming an artist. If they have the passion, <clears throat> they don't even have to have that much talent. I mean, they'll survive. I think when parents sometimes get a little nervous because, as Andy pointed out, there are some stereotypes of artists that are, you know, not what we want for our kids, I guess. But if, if, it, if they show that they are an artist and they maintain that, celebrate it. Help them. Do whatever you can to make sure they, they continue. But really, they need, if they don't show the passion, if, they, if they're just as interested in random things, then maybe they're not really an artist. They have some gifts, but they're not an artist. And then that's okay. Then, be, then it can become that hobby. But I don't think, I, don't, I, I worry about anyone who makes that decision too early. Because, wow, you know, most of us didn't know exactly what we were gonna do in junior high. Um, when I was um, a young pastor, we started a magazine for our youth called Young Branches, and there was a young lady, I think her name was Marie Holtz, that used to write poetry, and it was really beautiful poetry, and uh, uh, she sent me these poems, and I started encouraging her to keep writing more. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> the reason I bring that up is my parents were so good at encouraging me to continue developing the skills I had in art. And um, uh, my mom would take pastel drawings I did in seventh grade and frame them and put them in the house, uh, probably in a closet, but somewhere in the house, no. <laughs> but, um, and looking back on it, I was like, this wasn't that great of a drawing. But they were very encouraging. My father wrote a paper for a pastor's conference and when I was about probably eighth grade, and he asked me to do the headings to all of the parts of the paper in calligraphy, like old English calligraphy, and just encouraged me to do this. And, and it was going to hand it out to 80 pastors to read, you know, at some conference. And I felt really emboldened by this. It's like, wow, he thinks that my work is worthy of that, you know. Um, so I think, you know, parents can do a, a wonderful job of just encouraging children if they seem like they have a passion and interest in it. And, you know, my brother was actually a very good artist up until about ninth grade, and then he just dropped it, just decided he didn't want to do it anymore. And it was about, I was in about fifth grade at the time, and I got all of his drawing books and pencils and everything, and that's when I started uh, to really get into it. I cared about it before that. But... Um, uh, and my, my parents were encouraging to both of us. I guess the point is that there's a, a, your child will naturally figure out if they really don't want to do it anymore. But encourage them, you know, within reason, encourage them to develop whatever talents or skills God's given them. So, I have just one more quick thought. Uh, I'll share a personal secret here. It's a very public event. Um, for decades, I thought my calling was to be an artist. And it's only now, in retrospect, my calling is to be an arts educator. And that's what I'm a lot better at than art. I know too many people who are better than me in art, and I'm okay with that. But, uh, you know, I've got other things to do. But, um, uh, but you don't know until, a lot of times, it's only in retrospect you realize, you know, I can point to all the ways God led me to right now. And, and I'm very confident that that's what happened. I think your art's pretty good, though. Other question? Yeah. 
Uh, I think that a lot of students who get to Bethany have, uh, and even if they are interested in art, are arriving there with a lifetime of discouragement uh, <laughs> in doing art, where it's not, you know, getting an art degree is not really viewed as a real type of thing or something that offers you a career. And to me, that's intensely frustrating that this is a narrative that that we tolerate at all in our, our circles uh, because it, not in addition to being kind of offensive on the first, uh, it's also objectively untrue. There's a massive market for it, even if it's one that isn't particularly tapped, and that is our churches really do need these things. And, and Andy, you had brought up that um, the the Gothic guy whose whose thoughts kind of went in a bad direction, but the the innovator of uh, of Gothic art, he had this idea that you could use art to facilitate the teaching of transcendent topics. And that art should should make it easy for a person. I mean, that's the root of facilitate, right? It facilitate. Right? It makes it easy for you to approach these very high-minded topics. And then, and then, uh, Don, you, you mentioned in, in your presentation that we that we're losing kids because they aren't approaching these high-minded topics. They 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 are getting this very superficial type of religion. And so, I'm very very curious. What are the topics that you would want to see churches embrace or or use art to really to really showcase what are those topics that you think art can most easily uh, or most apparently uh, assist a church in teaching or showing or, or giving uh, to the people who are there well um uh, are you looking for practical examples of how or what? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, I, I know one thing that, that can be done is when you're teaching religion, let's say a confirmation class or a Bible class, include beautiful art in that and show how the church historically used these amazing gifts from God to, to teach the faith and, and how it's kind of linked together with that. So that's one thing that I think uh, can be done. Um, I think another thing is when, uh, when the subject comes up where we may have to spend some money for this, because that's often the issue, everything's bottom line dollar stuff, but when we have to spend some money from this in a church, that, that, it's, that we think of it, try to convince people to think of it a little bit differently, and it has a lasting value, it's, it has something that's, that's going to maybe you know, be in place for years to come. We look at architecture that way quite often, it has to be functional of course, but um, we think of the money we spend on architectural things if you add a new bathroom in your church. Uh, yeah, well, and then somewhat music, too, yeah. But, uh, you know, to try and, and, and it takes a little education, I guess, but to try and get people to think a little differently of the um, putting some money towards this. And these things don't just drop out of the sky for free, too. So, oh, yes. Kind of an issue though being paid because I have done so much work for the church over the years. Um, lots of covers, you know, back then it was pen and ink, and I did lots of them. Beautiful work, by paid. the way. <laughs> what you did, beautiful work, by the way. Yes, thank you. But then I do banners for the church, I designed a huge stained glass window. I never got paid for anything, sure. you know. I got paid more when I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know, doing yeah. art. Yeah. So there is, yeah, it's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. You do want to be an artist. It's hard getting paid, especially for the church work that you do. So. Right, I, I don't want to go too far off topic, but the idea of an artist getting paid for their work is a difficult one, even apart from religion <laughs> and religious circles. You know, the, the thing I tell people in class is, you can volunteer your work for a good cause, if you believe the cause to be just, but otherwise, never ever work for free. Because they, no one appreciates what they don't pay for. Not gonna, you can do, you know, these covers, people ask you to do them. Right, and, and it's a dis... Right? Bef and before you do it, you're just kind of, you're that person. You're the go-to person for all art. And, and, and why would you, you like it? Why would you pay, for, why would you want money to do that for you? And so everybody has to come to, come to their, their decision about what is worthwhile, which cause is actually worth my free time, which is, which is in, in, every, in any other profession, your free time equals money. Because I could be working right now, and getting paid, you know, but artists, everyone looks at art and they think, well, it's, it's fun, you would do that anyway, right? 
When I came to Mount Olive 25 years ago, they were paying the organist $15 uh, for a Sunday for two services. And I said, that, that, that's not even minimum wage. And, it's, and this, these people have to train to do this. What had happened is a woman prior to that, wonderful woman who had some means, had been the organist for 30 years and never, never took a paycheck for it. The congregation got used to the fact that it was free. And all of a sudden they had to pay for it. Well, now they couldn't build it into the budget, so well, let's give them 15 bucks for two services. And I started really speaking out against this, and, and this was the argument I made, and I would say the same is true with the visual arts. Um, if you want me to come in and clean the bathrooms, mm -hmm. and uh, that's fine, I can do that. Anybody in the church virtually can come in and clean the bathrooms. It doesn't take any training or skill or education. But if you're going to ask somebody to sit at the keyboard and play organ music for us to sing to and beautify our worship service, that takes a particular skill, and it took some education, and they had to invest themselves in being able to, plus they come in and practice for three, four hours during the week. And uh, the same is true with the visual arts. And we need to get that mentality into people's minds that, that you know, people have had to go get educated as to how to do this. And... Um, yeah, good. I agree. I agree. I, I know it's not, not an easy thing. But I wonder, too, if, if we perpetuate the, the problem by giving it up for free, too, you know. And, uh, yeah. And you love to do it. You know, it's your passion and things. But um, you, might, you might just bring it up to the pastor sometime and say, have you ever thought about the fact that, you know, we do pay our organists, but when I design a bulletin cover, you know, I, I'm never given any money for that. And I'm willing to do it, and it doesn't change what I do, but have you ever thought about that? People don't have to think about it because it is free. So There's a sentence I've had to use before, and it's, it goes like this. I'm not in a financial position to donate my work. And, you know, that kind of makes it clear you expect something. And I'm not against doing discounted work for churches because I've done that. But I do not like to do things for free because of what these men have been saying. It's, they don't appreciate it. People don't appreciate free. That's, that's a very good practical idea. The way, the way you bring up the subject is, is, is very important as far as you don't want to be pushy, and right? you don't want to be rude, but at the same time you have to be assertive. And I think that's awesome. There, there's a line that I use. I'll, I'll just say, so what have you built into the budget for this? What does your budget support? Because I'm not saying, what can you pay me? Because it's not their money either, right? It's the congregation's money. But uh, it brings up the notion that there should be a budget for this. And if there isn't, you've done something. You've forgotten something along the way. At a recent, a uh, couple recent meetings at Mount Olive, it's bothered me that our teachers weren't being paid up to synod scale. And uh, so what I would do is at the voters meeting, I would, I would ask that our secretary write a thank you letter to the teachers for their gift uh, that they're donating to the church that we're not paying them for and tell them how kind it is of them to let us short shrift them $2,000 of what we should be paying them. And it got people to realize, I think, that, yeah, I guess, you know, this is hard to write a thank you letter like that. And it would usually pass the idea. Now, I don't know if there's any application with this, you know, too, but um, is there some way we can express gratitude to people uh, who have given of their time and talent to do something that maybe we just kind of take for granted. Well, right now, I was going to say, right now, Peace just wants art to put up all over the walls, but I mean, just expect people to donate it. You know, I mean, it's... There's an, a, another thing, too, to be aware of. I, 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 want, I have an accountant who does our taxes for me, but I seem to remember it's a, a, a category of unrecoverable losses. So if you have a, a, an hourly wage that you that you uh, uh, would, would charge if you could, um, that's a write-off. The eight hours you spent on that thing, that's eight, eight times whatever that wage is, and that's, that is an unrecoverable, unrecoverable loss. I'm not going to say do this, but check with your tax accountant because in, in every other respect, this is a, it's a donation to charity. Your time is your money, and you've donated your time, and there's an equivalent amount of money that can be figured. That's a donation to a charitable organization. That's a tax exemption as far as I'm concerned. One last comment and on this subject. If people saw the amount of money it takes to buy the pigments and the paint and the oil and the canvas and the wood uh, and brushes and everything, they would just be blown away. 
uh, to, to come up with a, a painting the size of one of these bulletin boards behind us, you know, how much do, do the actual materials cost? We're not talking about the artist's, you know, talent and time, too. And a lot of people just have never had to buy art or do art to realize one tube of paint, I mean, my little watercolors the size of my finger, are, some of them are like 15 bucks. It's ridiculous, you know. And some of us import our oil paints from France <laughs> and refuse to use anything but. <laughs> I was trying to make that point with um, a, a representative from Peace because they wanted a $2,000 commission piece. And for the size that they wanted, it, would, it was about $1,200 just for the materials to do it in archival and that, not a frame. So before you start, you have $1,200 invested. If you're the artist buying those materials and then something goes wrong or they don't like it or they won't pay you, well, you know, that's, that's a loss. That is terrible. But it is expensive, and I don't know if we want to go much longer than we're supposed to. Is there one last comment or question? Um, I could do one more question. Ben's been waiting. I just, it's time to Oh, I'm sorry. Emily hasn't had a chance. Why don't go you for it. Oh, I, I don't know. Well, so you talked a little bit about living the artist life and that even the things that you enjoy, your quote unquote free time, is art related. Does that ever exhaust you? <laughs> Or bum you out, or because I, as you're saying that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I do that too. In on my vacation, you know, I had six hours of absolute free time, and I went to two museums. And eventually, it's like I'm enjoying all this art, and it's so beautiful. But like, I can only look at portraiture for so much longer. But then it's, but I enjoyed it so much, and it has so much to do with what I like and what I do and what I enjoy. So, do you, can you unplug it? I don't know. It doesn't. You know, it's exhausting, but I love it. I don't know. Can you speak to that at all? <laughs> For me, I, I'm, I never get tired of it. I could can do that all day and all night and all day and all night. But I can see, I mean, there are distractions that pull you back into reality. <laughs> and so even if you wanted to, you, normally you can't. But I think enjoy it while you can. Packers. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to edit that out. He'll edit, the, edit that well, there are things that, are, that will distract you enough, but I think if, if you can live like that, to me, it's been very rewarding. I don't know if I even need to add. If you want, are we done? Do you have a final, final question? I'll just say that, that when Bill talks about passion, um, that, that to me, there's, that's a loaded word, passion. Do you really, because how do I know if I'm passionate enough, right? So I would substitute maybe word like, you're just really into something. You're into it, right? Because people can get into Pinterest and they do all, they waste hours on Pinterest, right? So um, it's all about what are you really into? And, and do, if you're into it, you don't mind spending lots and lots of time. Just a quick note. It helps to have a spouse who's understanding of this. <laughs> Right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, my wife is great about, you know, if we're on vacation, she'll say, you know, I'm going to go do this or whatever. So if next three hours, if you want, why don't you go paint? And, and uh, to me, that's just like, oh, that's so nice. And, but even, even if we're out at a restaurant or something, I might have a sketchbook along. And so um, anyway, that's, yep. Fit it, you fit it in when you can. This is a good one to end on. I was just gonna say, do you think, do you think we're like harming ourselves with the narrative of like the big A art? Like if we only ever talk about it as like art, because there's so I talk to about students all the time with all the jobs there. Like painting is great, but if you can apply painting to graphic design or concept art or like any number of things, like the animation world alone is just like the jobs are endless. But we always talk about it in this context of like big A art, and we never just go, nope, it's a craft too. But you still, like, you go watch the person that directed Kung Fu Panda 2, what does she do in her free time? Looks at paintings. She looks at photography. Like, so she's invested in that, but she's directing an animated movie. So like, there's that correlation, but I feel like we don't talk about the craft side of it, where all the jobs are, because the painting isn't going to supply jobs for 3,000 people, but animation will. Yeah, I, right. I, 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 yeah, I think it's good to to teach children that you know just look at the clothing we're all wearing. Somebody had to design this, 
somebody had to figure out how this would possibly look right, you know, and, and what colors would go and things like that. If you look at the architecture in this room, there was, a, there was an element of design involved in that. Now, yes, that's totally different than painting a Lord's Supper painting for a church, but I think it's also good for children to realize that, that there's an artistic element involved in so many things. Um, we live in a very visual world, and, and um, uh, so there are multiple ways for your talents to be used. You know, and, and as far as pursuing something, I'll, I'll use my son Jacob as an example. So Jacob, my son, really loved music, loved to play guitar, was never probably going to make a living at it. But I encouraged him to keep learning music, and I said, why don't you try to find a profession you could fit in where that will be attached to it somehow? Where you can kind of, and so he's, he works for a media company that has a sound design element to it and things. And he does a lot of recording and stuff. And it's very fulfilling. And it's, it's close enough to his work that he still, once in a while, gets to use his artistic abilities, you know, along with that and with his work. So it's not always, a, a, you know, it's great if you can find a job where you're, you're just doing art. But maybe sometimes you have to attach it to, um, and I say this to guys looking at becoming pastors, the wonderful, wonderful thing about the ministry is God can find a way to, find, to, to use any other interest you have and have it fit into the ministry and serve, serve his work. So if you're really into you know, whatever it is and you want to still become a pastor, you can probably find a way to attach it to that and, and utilize it. So. I think we talk about art with a capital A just because it's traditional, it's old school, and people find a way to fit into the niche. I, I don't think it would be as helpful if we said, okay, now, um, you might be able to design gum wrappers someday. <laughs> that would be really cool. And it might be really cool, and it might really pay well, but I don't know if that's what you talk about. You know, I mean, you'll find that, yeah. that niche. I was just talking with my cousin Pete today, <laughs> and uh, I mean, there's a guy, he was super talented, but his, I had mentioned this, someone in Africa actually used his artwork for a postage stamp, but his niche is in comics, even though he's a great painter. He does comic book reprint drawings, and so that's what pays the bills. And so you talk about the, the big A uh, because it's theoretical and it's lofty, and it's kind of like if you were talking about basketball, you talk about the superstars of the NBA. You wouldn't say, hey, someday you're going to be on a, you're going to play Coach noon ball at Bethany, you know, <laughs> which might be don't, cool. Don't denigrate. <laughs> it's pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the mic picked that up. But <clears throat> anyway, anyway, thanks for coming. I think it was fun to talk about these things. Yeah, thank you, all of you. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Thanks.